To Each a Tempo, An Ace Attorney and a Leap Eat Agent's Fan Fiction. Chapter 23, Epilogue. The lobby crowds muttered. Maybe it was Phoenix's imagination, but everyone sounded relieved. We can't thank you enough, Mr. Wright. All of us. Phoenix took Stuart's handshake, and they both tried to smile. Pathos's point still chewed his conscience. Well, as long as you still have your cover, it's fine with me. But when all the other agents assisted us back there, what if someone in the courtroom noticed? Oh, yeah. Maya glanced up from rifling through Phoenix's briefcase. What if somebody else in there had music sense? Well, better to take a risk than to sit there doing nothing. And if something bad happens, we'll roll with it and keep doing our best. That's what I did for Mr. Pathos back then. The best I could. It's all anybody can do. Another clear peal of truth. Phoenix nodded. Maya held out the bags containing Stuart's microphone and shades, her head tipping thoughtfully. He still hates agents. Thanks. And I'm gonna talk to the commander. No hesitation in Stuart, just a clench of the bags and a rake at his hair. Cause, I mean, we can help him. I'm sure we can. We got the connections. Maybe we can change his mind even. You really think so? No, oh, he's not a bad guy. Except for the whole murdering an old lady thing. Stuart rubbed sheepish at the back of his head. I know what you're thinking, but nobody's really bad when you get right down to it. And just look at Mr. Pathos. He's smart, his eyes cool under pressure, he's got music sense like that, and nobody's even taught him what music sense is. I bet he could have been an agent. If the agency could inspire a 180 like that, well, what could stand in their way? Other than the end of the world. Maya brightened and came dangerously close to dropping the open briefcase. Don't worry, everyone will love agents someday. Just keep working at it, Stuart, and we're always up for dancing lessons. Speak for yourself. Hey, don't kid yourself, Mr. Wright. You're part of the team now, and besides, you got potential. If the lawyer thing doesn't work out, our door's always open. Spy gadgets and slick moves? Phoenix rubbed his neck. He had a hard enough time keeping his pant leg out of his bicycle chain. Uh, all right. Just make sure it's not a door surrounded by lasers. A familiar shade of magenta caught Phoenix's eye in the crowd. Edgeworth emerged and joined them. Maya didn't miss a beat. Hi, Mr. Edgeworth. Hello. I hope I'm not interrupting. He cast an uneasy eye over the conference circle. Arrangements have been made for your release, Mr. Lowe, once the final paperwork is done. It should take only a few more hours. Oh. Stuart blinked and straightened to attention. Uh, thanks. And right. Edgeworth flicked a look at him, smiling with his eyes. Next time we collaborate on a case, I expect you to share the necessary information before the trial begins. It took Phoenix a moment to find his tongue. He still missed Fox. <laughs> if I can, then sure, Edgeworth. But thank you. For everything. Edgeworth looked between Phoenix and Stuart, gaze lighting on the agency shades and microphone for a petrifying instant. If you're worried about Mr. Pathos' accusations, don't be. Uh, accusations? Did he make any new ones? He hasn't said a word since the trial ended, and he has no definitive evidence to back up his elite beat agent theories. We proved that already. He turned his stare to Stuart. I saw no suspicious events in your records, Mr. Lowe, and you've been found innocent by a court of law. That's all that's relevant here. Mr. Pathos's personal grudge against you is no concern of mine. Stuart nodded. One quick jerk. You must have known better than to ask questions. If that's all, then I'll be on my way. Sure. Thanks again, Edgeworth. Edgeworth left across the lobby. Quiet held for a moment. You got some great backup, Mr. Wright. Maya looked to him, eyes full of mischief. What about Mr. Edgeworth? I'll bet he has some smooth moves. Do you think you could teach him to dance? <sighs> Good luck, Maya. As Edgeworth left that lobby, the passers-by were minor static in his awareness. However foreign it seemed, with all that trust, all that forging on blind, working with Wright was inevitable and the right thing to do. At least he could accept that now. 
Oh, uh, Mr. Edgeworth! Gumshoe blundered his way along a throng of chattering women and charged to Edgeworth's side. Sir, I uh, just called the precinct. All the fingerprints do check out. And I'll have the files filled out for the microphone uh, as soon as I copy some new forms. Edgeworth had no plans to ask why. I uh, kinda got coffee on these ones. Because he knew better than to ask. He turned a neat corner towards the car park. Gumshoe's huge presence hovering behind. Very well, detective. He glanced to the olive trench coat in his peripheral vision. I trust you didn't get into a traffic accident this time? A uh, traffic... Oh! Uh, you mean when I was getting here with the evidence? Uh, no, not this time, sir. I just lost a mirror, but that one was held on with tape anyway. Lucky indeed, for everyone around him. If you continue performing this well on cases, detective, I'll have to see about having your salary raised. Possibly. You... You mean it, Mr. Edgeworth? You're the best, sir! If he began whooping, he could just forget about it. A smirk tugged at Edgeworth. We'll see. Adrenaline, Fox thought, standing tiny before the commander, made everything seem like a good idea. Khan poured over every line of her report, his hands folded. Chieftain silently filled one side of the office, his tall bulk relaxed on the couch. Video screens hummed louder than silence could ever be. A network of eight agents spread over miles. He looked up with jade flashing shades and unreadable cool. That's quite an undertaking. The distance wasn't as much of an issue as anticipated. The jamming signal was localized and didn't affect infrasound. And the triangulation? Calling that setup triangulation would make a geometry professor weep. Fox resettled her laced hands in front of her, goose flesh prickling over her like that first time she wore Agent Reds. We had two lines of sight within 100 feet, sir. Both personally familiar with the target. <sighs> We're all familiar with the target, at least typical location. Khan muttered acknowledgement. He turned a page. You led this effort, Fox? She had linked the entire team together, every sure-footed operative. Most of them held default leadership positions in their squads, but they had fallen into willing step behind Fox. A shiver settled in her stomach. Yes, sir. She led very well for the circumstances. She assessed and had her team in place within 70 seconds. She then chose basic alpha set and had a firm enough grasp of the target situation to relay effectively. I see. And there were possible secondary spirit channeling effects in the wake of the largest gathering of musical aptitude this agency has ever seen. You did this despite a known security risk working actively against the area agents. That was what gripped her and sank claws in. That was what forced her gaze to the ground. Fox knew the risks, and she had gone ahead anyway. She had potentially given Pathos new ammunition. Yes, sir. Agent, you have nothing to be ashamed of. She looked up sharp. Khan sat, contemplating her. Our strongest eight supported Phoenix Wright, and it worked. This was a risk, but a well-calculated one, and you ought to be proud. His tone was fatherly, the way that stirred memories and hot gratitude. Fox glanced to Chieftain, the brim of his Stetson nearly hiding his I told you so smirk, and she looked back to her feet, smiling wide and helpless. Thank you, sir. First day off since her orchard opened, and it just Swiss slicing figured she'd spend it visiting that miserable son of a demi sauced swine. Wasn't like he could visit her. It's good of you to come, Cherry. She huffed, settling her folded arms, staring at the grimy concrete floor. Might as well. It's not like the orchard's even peed a pack and open today. Silence. Guards' voices echoed down the hall. Cherry shook her head, and she looked up at it. Just... What the hell, Pathos? Through scuffed old plexiglass and a crumpled suit and limp hair, he smiled the same as any other day. I don't even know myself. I thought I was working toward justice, I suppose. Any shot I could take at the agents, any sort of revenge I could manage, but I became far too reckless. I assure you, Cherry, I never meant for any of this to reflect on you. All that plotting around the CIA or whatever, and you couldn't even think about the freaking consequences? I did. 
Not until it was too late. Pathos was doing that thoughtful, soul-prying look again. Cherry's frown twisted, and she watched her quick-bouncing knee. Boy, did cargo pants look weird on her. It didn't move like chef's hound's tooth at all. I've been thinking since the end of the trial. I can't be sure how much of my theory is true, and how much I've leaped to conclusions on. I think I may have taken too much personally these past years. You think too damn much. You might try it, Chef. She glared at him. Pathos' smile softened. What I mean is... He looked to the hand in his lap that somebody had put a real botched job of a gauze dressing on. Getting too absorbed in a cause can make one blind. I'd hate to see it happen to someone as devoted as you. Anybody who had the flower-dredging nerve to tell her what to do with her orchard could just go and suck on a lemon and... So what if Cherry cared too much? She stood, chair legs screeching. I, I don't have all day. Gotta do inventory. Day off or no day off, praise it up, Bourguignon. The food didn't order itself. Pathos nodded. If you visit again, please bring in an order of the venison and pilaf. Prison food is a sad offering, indeed. Bring you... She stopped. The thought percolated through, and, well, fine. Maybe she smirked a bit. If you think I'm going to stick a quiche cut in hacksaw in a perfectly good order of pilaf pathos, you can go soak your stinking head. Cherry left the detention center, sun stabbing her eyes. Barley's rust bucket heap of a beater car hunkered at the end of the lot, waiting for her. The brick weight of her life was settling again. She had inventory to do, plus a batch of bechamel to get on and lamb to clean. The electric bill grew by peace showing leaps every month, and somebody needed to get a chewing out for that. That half case of arugula was at death's door, and if she didn't make cost... Did what's-his-face call back? Barley startled, nearly dropping her cell phone about six times. Uh, y yes, just now, actually. Familiar shape of a lighter in her hand, familiar muted rattle of the box, click, click, click. <sighs> Cherry dragged long enough to think and sighed draping her cigarette hand out the window. Vander something. Mr. Vanderspiegel. She muttered and rubbed between her eyes. How much? 30,000. He pulled a notepad from under the seat. I, I wrote it down to make sure. It looks mostly like a silent partner thing. He once used the facilities for events, and he said he can help with staffing. C control stays with you. It's still your name on on all the, the, the papers, I, uh, I asked. Huh. He... Barley paused to grin, broad and boyish. He said that he approved of your choice of fonts on, on the flyer, and he knows your uncle Smokey? He, he seems really nice. I, I think so, anyway. Oh, sure. Perfect opportunity for someone to come along with just the step up Cherry needed and offer, with a smile and a frickin' flourish, to buy out her orchard. Cherry watched smoke twine and vanish. Barley squirmed against the upholstery. Do you think- She frowned. She didn't ask stuff like this. She never had. Am I too caught up in the place? He choked the first syllables of an answer. What a nice day outside. All too blue sky, fluffy white marshmallow clouds, sun draping Cherry's skin warm. Come on, spit it out. Barley gulped. She glanced sidelong to see him smoothing his pants. You, you just work so hard. I worry sometimes. Enough to crash court. There, she said it. Y yeah. No hesitation. Not that Barley had ever told her a word of a lie. If Pathos thought she was blind, and Barley worried himself to bits, and her temper flared red nowadays if she even thought about customers, uh, Cherry raked the hair from her face. She'd have to rebraid the front- No, only one braid in the back today. Casual really did feel weird. That wasn't normal, was it? You know what? Inventory can kiss my grits. I'm off today, same with you, kid. An uneasy stir in her gut. She shook her head. Fry it. I shouldn't call you that. I don't mind. Doesn't matter if you mind. He paused and nodded, a twitch at the edge of Cherry's vision. They sat in the hot gold afternoon. You, you know what I miss? Is you yelling at the food channel. Bunch of frilly powder puff measure happy housewives probably need a recipe to boil water. <laughs> like that. Here came the bashful grin again. I st still have cable. 
fine. She flicked her cigarette butt to the ground. Hey, let's order a pizza while we're at it. Eggs frickin' Florentine, we might as well. Okay. He turned to the steering wheel, wearing a fool smile, hair in his eyes. And I think I have something to tell you, Cherry. Something else? Sure. She had the energy for this stuff, after all. The car rumbled awake, breeze flowed around her, and through the novelty of her loose bangs, Cherry leaned back and smirked. Fine, let's hear it. Keep the details straight, Star thought to the beat of her stilettos. Cases that made the news got overhyped. Seropathos was still a human being. She'd need to work the slipped through society's cracks angle, easy on the doe-eyed pleading, treat the chief prosecutor like a debate opponent. Mission briefs didn't say all business if they didn't mean it. She tugged her suit jacket straight and watched the lime-bright elevator display crawl through its numbers. If she weren't used to nudging fate, she'd be shaking more than she was. Hey, excuse me. It took a moment to click. The voice called to her, and next thing she knew, someone bright orange held out a paper at her. Drop by the orchard, where the finest seasons of the flavor grow. Oh. Star blinked and had a better look at him. Scruffy and sandy blonde and offering a megawatt grin along with the flyer. Thank you. She accepted it and smiled as best she could. But I think he meant flavors of the season. Balancing the rest of the flyers on one elbow, he scratched the back of his head. I don't know. I'm dumber on pretty girls. Star clasped a hand to her chest. She couldn't remember the last time anyone said it to her face. W well, I... No, I mean it. He poked a thumbs up from under the load of flyers. You're even prettier than my last three girlfriends. I'll bet you're a model. He was awfully cute, argued the sudden flutter inside of her. That's very sweet of you, mister. He took her offered hand and didn't seem to plan on doing anything with it. Unless that beamy, goofy grin counted. Larry! Larry Bus, And I bet your name's as gorgeous as the rest of you. Pure earnest and warm hands? She had to be blushing. What was her name right now? Clear lenses in her glasses, and she was wearing flax blonde hair, so today she was... Astra Blake. Actually, I could use- A moment to compose herself before this crucial phase of the mission. Some fresh air. Would you like to come for a walk? It seemed a little on the sudden side to Star, but Larry welled up with dewy-eyed joy like it was his childhood dream come true. Really? I mean, yeah, sure. Whatever you want, babe. Just a few minutes relaxing with this guy and everything would surely turn out better. Smiling warmer, Star took her hand back. She beckoned and Larry obediently followed. Wright & Co. always felt like a warmer place after a win. Maybe it was the satisfaction of defending the innocent. Or maybe it was the accompaniment of gathering old takeout cartons, scrubbing the toilet until it shone, and giving Charlie a good watering. Either way, today was a good day. It ran out? Pearl looked up at Phoenix, hurt and scolding, filling her huge eyes. Mr. Nick, you should have told me! Uh, sorry Pearl, we were kind of busy. But Pearl had already plucked the Magatama from his hand and scampered to the office couch with a flap of pink robes. Rubbing the back of his neck and watching the little girl in meditation pose, statue still, Phoenix turned back to Maya. I guess we could have... What are you doing? Organizing all these books. She grinned at him from her stepladder perch, arms full of law tomes. So it's easier to find the one you want to read. It doesn't get much easier than alphabetical order. Oh. For a long moment, Maya gazed contemplatively at the cover of Historic Precedent, 11th edition. Well, it's not like anybody reads them anyway. To be fair, Phoenix was working on it. Sort of. He kept the books dusted, at least. And then a knock at the door grabbed their attention. Maya ran for it. I've got it. Sheesh. She acted like there was a burger delivery on the other side. She couldn't still think the burger place would deliver, even if she was their best- Hey! He knew those voices. Phoenix was out into the main office before another thought. Here were red-costumed friends dropping by, Missy squealing delight with her arms around Maya's neck, Fox shifting around the cute but possibly contagious scene. You made it! I just knew you- Oh wow, Stuart, looking sharp. He wore a pressed suit, yellow flashing shades, and hair that spectacularly defied gravity. 
But Stuart still grinned and gave an easy shrug, closing the office door behind him. I'm not Stuart. Not anymore. Agent J here. And it's thanks to you guys. J it is. Pearly, come meet our friends. Missy bounced toward Phoenix, skidding to a stop, producing a stack of papers from... Uh, wherever female agents produce things from. Here, Nick. The commander sent these. They're completely boring. I already checked for you. Hopefully, Missy found paychecks boring. Fox sidled closer, smile slowly widening. There's a paycheck in there, in case you're wondering. Did agency microphones read minds? Okay, I see a radio. I'd better get this party started. Uh, go ahead and throw her out if she gets rowdy, Mr. Wright. He probably will throw you out. You kids and your newfangled noise. As Phoenix was opening his mouth to protest that he wasn't that bad, Maya, a cool hand laid on his arm. Fox, her smile still wry. We've only got an hour, actually. If it's all right, Phoenix, I was hoping for a group photo. Radio static cut into a heavy dance beat, something he heard snippets of on all the popular stations. Phoenix lifted a brow at the chattering scene in his office, and he smiled and nodded. That photo got a place of honor on his desk. Every time Phoenix looked at it, he felt a beat. To Each a Tempo was written by Pyrosaur. Ace Attorney and Elite Beat Agents are owned by Capcom and Enis, respectively. The narrator for this story is Gendiota COG. The voice of Phoenix Wright is Lasney. The voice of Maya Fang is Miki. The voice of Miles Edgeworth is Lazy Ace Dia. The voice of Larry Butts is Jake McGuire. The voice of Dick Gumshoe is Gendiota COG. The voice of Pearl Fang is Rose of Sweetness. The voice of Agent J is Gendiota COG. The voice of Agent Chieftain is also Gendiota COG. The voice of Agent Missy is Airbrica. The voice of Commander Khan is Gendiota COG. The voice of Agent Star is Swivel Swirl. The voice of Cherry Laflamme is Katie Hyatt. The voice of Barley Dempster is Ronson Harrington. The voice of Agent Fox is Galen Skibiak. The voice of C.R. Pathos is Todd Wilson. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed listening to this story as much as we all enjoyed performing it. And we'll see you next week with another story to tell.